Hello everyone and welcome to Don't Be Bored and welcome to my top 100 games of all time. Yes, I'm refreshing the list that I did probably about a year and a half ago. To give a little bit of context, I've got 26 brand new games on this list, caveated with some of them are just variants of games that were on previously. So it's a new variant, so it's a, technically a new game. But yes, 26 brand new games on the list. There's only two games that have retained their exact positioning. There's been a lot of rises and fallers. So uh, let's jump into the list and just know that every three days I'm going to release the next sort of chunk of ten. So let's jump into the first chunk. Let's jump into the top 100 games of all time. At number 100 is a really cool dice worker placement game, Rajas of the Ganges. This one has like a number of games on the list fallen for me, I think because of lack of playtime, that it's not hit the table as much in the sort of last uh, year and a half, two years since I made the previous list. And it's actually dropped quite a lot. It's well nearly off the list, but it was up in 53 last year. If you don't know, Raja the Ganges allows you to roll these dice and then place them as workers out. The best bits of this game is that a six doesn't necessarily beat a one because different spots need different numbers. So normally when you're rolling a dice, you're like, oh, I've, I haven't rolled a loads of sixes. I'm going to have a worse time than someone else that did. Well, actually, no. You know, this spot over here, you need a one or a two to go to. You can't use a six. That's on a different spot. So actually, therefore, all the different numbers are useful in different ways. Also, it's got this cool double track thing where it's where you cross and meet on these, like, um, I can't remember quite what they're called, but almost like a fame track and a money track that cross over. But a cool experience. It's just the playtime and not hitting the table that's seen this one really drop down. The first new game on the list is Snowman Dice and well actually this one was just off the list previously and has jumped up into the top 100 at number 99. This is a fun little dice flicking game that I can definitely see over the next month or so hitting the table more because it has that wintry Christmas vibes via the theme. And I think this maybe hurts the game because you feel like it's odd playing it in summer. So maybe that's why it's quite so high, but it's fun. You have to basically roll these dice and you're trying to roll like the feet, the body, and then the head of a snowman. And then you're trying to roll an arrow that allows you to push your snowman towards the North Pole in the middle of the table to win. But if you roll a snowball, you can flick that snowball at someone else's snowman. And if you knock it down, they have to start again. And it's just good fun family chaos. Very quick experience, very quick teach. A fun one in a sort of rounded squidgy packaging. That is Snowman Dice. Number 98 is another heavy game that's come down quite a way and I think it's probably again just not having the time to play heavier games. I think overall my list has got a bit lighter this time and Great Western Trail is one sort of thing that has fallen down as a result. I still really enjoy the logics of this one especially I love the production of the newer version although I've only got the original one on my shelf. The new one has like a bit brighter colours and cowboy hats on the meeples and that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the original is still the same rough, there's some tweaks, but rough gameplay. If you're going along these trails trying to deliver your hands of cows at the other end for points. But I love the way you can put buildings along the way, which A, add opportunities to you, almost like worker placement spots that you can do these certain actions but other things that maybe cost your opponents money uh, to, to go past or, or, or just slow an opponent down because now they can't just run along that route that's empty, there's something they have to stop along it. And that sort of goodness, I, I like the, the weight of the game, it's just the weight stops it hitting the table a lot these days. But a good game if you want sort of a cool, thinky experience that's based around cows. So, Great Western Trail, 
It deserves its spot on the list, and I do want to play it again now I'm talking about it. Galaxy Trucker. What can I say? It's a super fun game if you can get it to the table. It's just I'm struggling to get it to the table these days. I go for other games over it, and that's why actually it's the game that has fallen the furthest since last time I did my list. I do think it's super fun the way you have this pile of ship components in the middle, you have a ship board, and you're grabbing pieces, attaching thrusters, oh, I need some energy, oh, I need some shields, some, some guns to shoot asteroids and all that sort of stuff. I do love how it comes together, and then you fly your ship round and bits fall off, and it's definitely got that comedic, laugh-at-yourself sort of gameplay as, oh, a chunk of my ship has just fallen off. Don't expect going into Galaxy Truckers that your ship is going to survive. I just feel, actually, I've got a couple of expansions in the box, and that maybe slows getting the game to the table down. I'm almost tempted to get rid of the expansions or sort them back out into their own box, so then I can just play the base game with brand new players, because it's a struggle to... I find it's a bit of an awkward one sometimes to teach to brand new players, and that's maybe putting me off actually getting it to the table as much as it could because I think once you've taught it to a group and they've enjoyed it, it's very easy to go back and play it. I just need to do that sort of teach step again. So getting rid of other boards and the expansion which added like a brown alien would be beneficial. Big City 20th Anniversary Jumbo Edition is a well, it's a big game. It's got these very chunky, uh, resiny sort of buildings that you're putting down. And it's got this really cool card system where you are trying to basically almost get a row or a, a, a block, an area of the board. And you're sort of, you've got to do this weird trade thing at the end of each turn where you may be getting rid of one that doesn't look very good. But if you put it face up, people will know it's not very good. And if it's face down, you go later because you're not giving as much information away in the taking of cards. But it's all about trying to put these buildings down and score points. And you get this cool, really cool city building up in front of you as you add a section of board. And now all of a sudden, the cards that are like 30 to 40, those cards can now actually be played. So they're useful. I was getting rid of some before, but now that area of the board is buildable so I can put uh, this housing area down and the housing wants to maybe be on the edge whereas the commercial like office buildings wants to be in the middle. I like that sort of logic of you put this in a certain place it will get you bonus points, it's city building and there's that cool uh, collection of cards where it's like I want 21, 22 and 23 to play this three sized building there. I really like that. It, it's just one of the ones that's quite big, quite heavy, which means it only gets played here. I very rarely put it in my backpack and take it to a friend's, even though I do want to play it more. But still, Big City, a great experience to play. And whether Foundations of Rome, which is on the shelf, maybe will knock it off the list as that gets played more. We'll see. Maybe next time I do the list, see if it's still there. But at the moment, Big City is in my top 100. My number 95 is the first game so far that's actually moved up. It's only moved up one position. It last, year, last year, last time, it was 96. It's 95 this time, and it's Mechs versus Minions. This is one that I really want to go back to playing. We've actually been playing a friend's copy. I don't actually own the game, but we played quite a chunk of it at a friend's um, as uh, two couples working our way through the different levels overcoming all these minions and actually I really enjoyed the programming. There's something to be said about a really good programming game. There's a few that do programming and it's like eh, like Robo Rally. I just didn't get on with that one. It didn't click for me. But the co-op one where you're all cheering for the same thing so if something goes wrong you're all like ah no sort of thing and you're trying to take out these literal wave after wave of minions I really enjoyed that, and the way things, oh, 
uh, you've been damaged, so you swap two cards around, now you're doing something in a different order, and oh, my programming's been mucked up, and all that sort of goodness. You sort of draft cards between the players to add to your um, sort of order, your programming, so all of a sudden, yes, I can now get that one, so I can actually turn at the right time, so be uh, firing in the right direction, that sort of goodness. Really enjoyed Mechs vs Minions, again it's one I want to play more of this and then it will probably go up a little bit. Number 94 is another new to the list game and actually this one is pretty much a brand new one to me in the last year and a half and it's before the guests arrive. Now specifically I've actually played more of the Huggy Hoogar version of the game but they play almost identically and I prefer the theme of the original which I do now own in the collection. So before the guests arrive is this card game where it's a bit of a push your luck and I don't always vibe with those but this one I do and you're just trying to effectively go okay um, I've got this um, person they are trying to clean up or in the Hoogar Huggy version I've got this animal and it allow me to store some red cards okay well I've got these couple of red cards that match I can play those or do I wait and try and get some more of that exact red item and then I can bank it in one go for more points and it's when do you do that because at the end you're going to lose points for cards left in your hand you're only scoring for the cards that you've got played down so it's this real sort of dynamic of uh, um, i'm taking these cards but am i going to be able to actually get them down to score or are they going to lose me points and it's a quite quick card game definitely would recommend it it's much more easily accessible by the huggy version from helvetique but personally i like the artwork and style Otherwise, gameplay is the same of before the guests arrive. Number 93 is another new to the list game. So we are cracking quite a few straight away in this first block of 10, and it's Blood on the Clock Tower. Now, this is like the big king almost of social deduction games. So why is it not higher with its sort of resistance Avalon or one of those on steroids? It's quite hard to actually get games of this in. First of all, the games of those other sort of social deduction games normally last like 20 minutes. This can last a lot longer, like easily double that for a game that's going on. You need a lot of people, really you do need a gathering of at least, I think it's probably like seven people, eight people. Other people might change that, like say 10 or whatever to get the full experience because you start dropping characters out and everyone in this has their own thing. That's what's cool about this social deduction game. No one's just a boring villager. No one is, oh, I'm a good guy, honest. It's, it's like, I am a good guy. I am this specific character. I can do this. I get this bit of information that's specific to my character. I find out every night, oh, the people next to me are good or bad. And then someone else's might be, I get to confuse that person and maybe have given them the one for one night the wrong answer. So then they start to question it. And like any good social deduction game, the whole way through you are questioning, is this person lying to me? Oh, I've got these two bits of information. And if I add those together, maybe they are telling the truth. Okay, I'm going to have to believe you unless anything contradicts that. And if we go with that, run with that information, then they're the bad guy. And you're trying to effectively either kill off uh, and get away with it or find out who the, uh, the, like, the devil is or whatever in that scenario. I've only played like one or two of like basic scenarios. I've not dabbled with the harder ones or the experience. Merin, look, the experimental ones or, or ones that other people have written online and all. you get people writing special ones for like Valentine's Day or Christmas or Halloween I've done none of that and I've still really enjoyed my plays of this Number 92 is another game where you've got that social deduction -y sort of stuff going on but a much simpler and very artistic one, Detective Club. In this game, you are sort of given these magical illustration cards almost. Think Dixit if you have played that sort of game. Basically, an illustrate, these cards all have like 
surreal, abstract sort of stuff drawn on them. This artwork that could be many, many different things if that's what you allude to it. And one person will write a word on these pads, pass them out, but one person doesn't get the word. So let's say the word is water. I play a card, but don't say anything. The next player plays a card, so everyone plays one, then everyone plays one again. Then you go around and explain why you played those cards and the person sat there not knowing what the card was has to basically bluff why they did it. It's to me a preferred version of like the chameleon or something like that but uses these amazing artwork cards in a very cool socially sort of bluffing way. Really like it and it's, it was one that maybe had fallen off my list until more recently when I got it to the table again with some friends and we had an absolute blast playing it. So that is Detective Club. Maybe it'll go even higher uh, as I play it more, but what a fantastic game it is. And we're nearly at the end of this part of the list, the first 10, and this one is Deep Dive. Now this is a push your luck game, and I'm normally quite adverse to those, but this one does it in a really pure form. You First of all, it's got a penguin theme, and you are one of these penguins, and you, you dive down to the first layer. You turn a tile over. That's going to score you some points. Do you take it, or do you risk going down the next level? The next level, those fish are probably worth more points, but there's the chance of it being a rock which sinks you down to the next layer automatically. So you've got to do the risk again. It could be one of the dangerous animals that locks your penguin in. All those sort of choices and it's just a very pure form of push your luck. You're getting there. Do you take the points that you're going to get or do you push your luck for more points? And it's super quick, super intuitive to play. It looks pretty nice on the table as well. The penguin thing really doesn't hurt it. That's Deep Dive. A nice simple one to finish this first 10. There you have it. There's the first 10. And hopefully you've already heard of some good games. Let me know of these 10, what was your favourite? And are you surprised by a few of the new ones that have added to the list? Let me know in the comments section below and subscribe because in a few days time, every three days, I'll be releasing the next batch of 10 in this top 100 series. Until then, there'll be other stuff on the channel, but also have a fantastic day gaming.